If you mention the name Macbeth, most people will immediately think of the Shakespeare play without realising that Macbeth was actually a real historical figure. The story of Macbeth, the historical figure, is actually quite fascinating and also covers one of the most neglected eras in history, that of Dark Age Scotland. One of the problems with telling the story of Macbeth is there are virtually no surviving historical records or histories of Macbeth, just fleeting mentions often of no more than a single sentence in the various chronicles of the time, such as the Annals of Ulster, the Annals of Tigernach, or even the writings of Marianus Scotus. And it's only by assembling all of these fleeting mentions that we can hope to try and piece together this man's life. So by tying together all of these documents, I hope to give an insight into a very, very little known era of Scottish history. At the dawn of the 11th century, Scotland was a declining nation, and one that really shouldn't have survived at all. It was little over half the size of modern day Scotland, and surrounded by enemies on all sides. And within, it was equally divided. It was divided into Highland and Lowland, and then again into Monmere, or Eldums. Each of these eldums had little in common with each other except a mutual hatred and treachery towards one another. To the north, the Hebrides and Orkney Islands, as well as part of the mainland, Caithness, was in the hands of the Northmen. These were ever building up strength to both raid and snatch more Scottish territory. To the south was England and the powerful earldom of Northumbria, the traditional foe with its greedy eyes ever on taking territory from the lowlands of Scotland. To the west was the independent kingdom of Strathclyde, which covered Strathclyde in Scotland, but also Cumbria in northwest England. Strathclyde was going through a mini renaissance and was a jagged fawn in Scotland's side. But worst of all, King Canute was building his Scandinavian empire and was intent in adding the Scottish crown along with those of Denmark, Norway and England. Scotland only hung on to life with a thread. Within Scotland, the Mormere in principle owed fealty to the king, who could call upon them to defend Scotland from foreign invaders. Among these earls, one stood out in power, the northerly province of Moray. Moray then stretched from the west coast to the east coast, and encompassed almost the entire of the Grampian Mountains. The power of Moray rivalled that of the king himself. Technically, the Earl of Moray was still a vassal of the king, though the Irish chronicles always refer to him as the King of Moray, reflecting the fact that the Earl of Moray was virtually an independent monarch of the Highlands. Throughout medieval history, the kingship of Scotland was always a bloody business, more a matter of plots and assassinations than rightful succession. In the 11th century, never was this more true. So precarious was the position of Scotland that a single weak link and the nation would succumb to the wolves that surrounded it. Just as Edward I's empire in England collapsed and fell apart in the hands of his son, Edward II, or as Henry V's conquests of France were left in the hands of the infant Henry VI. One weak ruler of Scotland and it would be overrun. Scotland avoided this by not practising primogeniture. Primogeniture has become very familiar to us in modern times. We tend to assume that this is how it was always practised, that the throne would pass from father to eldest son. However, in the past, various other systems were used. One of these was tanistry, which was still practised in Scotland in the 11th century. Tanistry worked where a Scottish king or lord or earl would name a Tanais as his heir. The Tanais was an adult selected from among the lord's larger family group. The Tanais would be an adult proven in battle and capable of ruling. The Tanais would come from his extended family, including brothers, nephews, uncles, sons, stepsons, cousins, etc., which would have the effect that the extended family of the lord or earl or king during the height of his reign would be in a constant state of brutal struggle with each other to be the Tanais. When the noble in question died, in an ideal world, the Tanais would become the lord and often slaughter his entire extended family to secure that position. More often than not, though, a relative not named Tanais 
would get in first, murdering both the Lord and his Tanes, proving him even more ruthless and canny and fit to rule. When a new lord or king or earl came to power, he then immediately had to find an extended family himself to begin the struggle to succeed him. Family ties were given a very low priority, and adoption, or by marrying widows with sons, was considered just as a legitimate way of getting Atanes as with blood relatives. So in many ways, Scotland owed its continued existence to social Darwinism, at least practiced by the ruling class. This then was the world Macbeth was born into around 1005, the son of Finlech Macruarid, the Earl of Moray. Little is known about his ancestry, but it's possible he was the grandson of King Malcolm II of Scotland through his mother. When Macbeth was around 15, his father was murdered by his cousin, who became Earl, and began the natural slaughter of his entire extended family. One of the advantages of tanistry, unlike primogeniture, is children are usually spared from the slaughter. This is because children are no threat because they don't have any experience in battle to qualify them as Tanes. But Macbeth, at the age of 15, was old enough to be considered a threat and disposed of. The young Macbeth, however, seems to have had his head screwed on and managed to flee south to the sanctuary of the court of Malcolm II. There, the young Macbeth resided in Malcolm's court for at least a decade, finding both favour and high office which suggests he was quite capable. In 1031, he is mentioned as one of the emissaries sent by Malcolm II to Canute, delivering Malcolm's submission after Canute's invasion of Scotland, along with two other Scottish kings. A year later, Macbeth's torch was so strong he was able to raise an army and march on Moray itself to avenge his father's murder and become Earl. Arriving with a band of men, he caught the current Earl, his cousin, Gillam Comgain, his father's assassin, by surprise. Gillam Comgain took refuge in one of his strongholds, which Macbeth surrounded with his men, set the stronghold on fire, and burned Gillam Comgain and fifty of his men to death. Macbeth was now Earl of Moray, the second most powerful man in Scotland, he had served his king for over a decade and proven himself a canny and ruthless politician as well as a capable commander. He probably considered himself a good candidate to be named Tanes by Malcolm. However, Malcolm was about to drop a bombshell on both Macbeth and Scotland. In 1034, Malcolm II died. On his deathbed, he abolished Tanistry and adopted primogeniture in common with many European countries as the legitimate method of succession. Malcolm named his young unproven grandson Duncan as his heir, his own son being ineligible having joined an order of monks. This would have been all well and good if Duncan had been proven a good king, but Duncan's reign was quickly to turn into a series of disasters. The first of these, shortly after becoming king and probably very aware of the fact he needed to prove himself, Duncan made an overly bold move, invading the territory of the Norse to the north. Now, no details of what this bold move to the north was, or any military campaign of Duncan's survive. But, around about the same time, the saga of Orkney Yinga appeared, telling the story of a massive Scottish attempt to regain the islands and their calamitous defeat in the final battle. So, perhaps we can assume this was the aggressive move that Duncan made that ended in disaster. Anyway, after Duncan's defeat, his position was very weakened. Duncan decided to remedy this by going on the offensive again, and in 1039, he struck a blow to the south against his main foes, the Northumbrians. This time, he led the forces personally, laying siege to Durham. However, the siege quickly deteriorated into a shambles as the city held out. The besieging Scots ran out of supplies and retreated in chaos. The only surviving account of the event is in the Historia Ecclesiae Danemelensis. It reads, Dunican, king of the Scots, advanced with countless multitude of troops and laid siege to Durham and made strenuous but ineffective attempts to carry it. For a large proportion of his cavalry was slain by the besieged and he was put to a disorderly flight in which he lost all of his foot soldiers, whose heads were collected in the marketplace and hung up on the posts. Not long afterwards, the same king, upon his return to Scotland, was murdered by his own countrymen. 
So we can see the account not only tells us of the disaster in Northumbria, but it also tells us of Duncan's murder. We know that Macbeth became king after Duncan's murder, but the account also makes another suggestion that when it says he was murdered by his countrymen, that perhaps Macbeth wasn't working alone, but actually had the consent of the other earls. In fact, the fact that Macbeth's coup never resulted in a civil war and followed two calamitous defeats just suggest that the other earls were supporting Macbeth. That sentence is also the only account of the death we have, and it's from that one sentence a certain Mr Shakespeare got an entire play. While there's no account of Duncan's death itself, there are announcements of his death were made around the country in several chronicles. In the 1040 entry in the Annals of Ulster, a simple sentence says, Doncat, son of Crinan, king of Orba, was killed by his own people. The Annals of Tigernatch reported, Duncan was killed at an immature age, with no, other, no further elaboration. The Chronicle of Melrose states, By Macbeth, the son of Finleg, he was struck down. The mortally wounded king died in Elgin, in Moray. While the chronicler Mariana Scotus wrote, Duncan, the king of Scotland, was killed in the autumn by his earl, Macbeth Finleg's son. These few sentences perhaps give us some insight into which we can work out how Duncan died. The first one is the fact that he says Duncan died in Moray, not in the lowlands of Scotland, suggests that Duncan maybe took the initiative against the rebel Macbeth and marched to attack him. The fact that he was mortally wounded suggests he died in battle also. And finally, a local legend suggests that Duncan died at a battle called Boff Ganfain and was taken to a blacksmith's hut where he died of his wounds, which means the actual events of Macbeth killing Duncan was very different to what Shakespeare wrote. With Duncan dead, Macbeth was now king of Scotland. However, the hereditary heir of Duncan was Duncan's son, Malcolm Canmore, who proclaimed himself king. However, Malcolm Canmore could raise no support and Scotland supported Macbeth on the throne, another indication that Macbeth came to the throne with the support of the other earls. Apparently, Malcolm Canmore and his brother tried to gain support for a rebellion against Macbeth for two years and failed. They then went into exile in Northumbria in England. The first serious challenge to Macbeth's throne came in 1045, when Duncan's father, Crinan, who was the abbot of Dunkeld, a position that commanded substantial resources, organised what could be described as a sizeable rebellion, which left 180 of his men dead. Why Macbeth left Crinan in such a strong position when he had usurped his son, is a mystery. Was Crinan one of the lords that supported Macbeth's coup in Scotland's darkest hour against his son? Was Macbeth still ruling independently enough from the other earls to be allowed to dispose of him, or was Macbeth showing a fatal weakness by not brutally deposing his enemies, something he notably didn't do to many of the others who would be a party to his downfall? After the failure of Crinan's rebellion, the middle years of Macbeth's rule seem to have been one of relative stability and prosperity. In 1052, he showed great statesmanship when Edward the Confessor expelled all the Normans from England. Macbeth granted them refuge and lands, and many of them loyally served him to the end. There is virtually no information whatsoever about the middle period of Macbeth's rule, except the only clear mention is in the prophecy of Birchen, and this gives us a rather interesting picture of Macbeth. It says, the ruddy-faced king will possess Scotland. The strong one was fair, yellow hair, and tall. Brimful of food was Scotland, east and west, during the reign of the ruddy, brave king. This account not only tells us about what Scotland was like, but gives us our own image of the man himself. Strong, brave, and ruddy, meaning red-faced, perhaps with rage. If this is added to tall, fair, with long blonde hair, a picture of a huge, terrifying warrior emerges, the kind of man to forge a country in a violent age. The line brimful of food suggests what the facts seem to support. Scotland was a stable and prosperous land during this time. In fact, so stable 
that in 1049 Macbeth felt secure enough to leave Scotland and go on pilgrimage to Rome. Leaving a country was a big deal for any medieval king. But for Macbeth, with the pretender Malcolm Canmore exiled in Scotland's main rival, Northumbria, this was a bold move of a confident man, assured in his position. Macbeth arrived in Rome in Easter of 1050, where he visited the poor areas of the city and scattered so much silver in the streets it was written about by the monks in Hamburg. Why he went on this pilgrimage was less clear. As a Norman ally, was he seeking more favour from the Pope against England? Was it to try and get the Pope to legitimise his rule over Malcolm Canmore? Or maybe he was just genuinely pious? However, it was in towards the end of Malcolm's reign discontent began to emerge in Scotland. The reasons for this are unknown, but for the first time Malcolm Canmore found support for his cause in Scotland, and he was to return to haunt Macbeth. Earl Seward of Northumbria had harboured Canmore for many years, but not out of kindness, but as a card to play in a prolonged struggle between the two realms, and he decided to play it. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reports, This year went Seward the Earl with a great army into Scotland, both with ship force and land force, and fought against the Scots, and put to flight King Macbeth, and slew all were his chief men in the land, and led thence much booty, such as no man before had obtained. But his son Osborn, and his sister's son, Seward, and some of his huskulls, and also the kings, were found slain on the day of the seven sleepers. So Seward and Canmore rode at the head of a large army into Scotland and defeated Macbeth. However, it's not this straightforward. Amongst the Northumbrian army were a lot of personal troops of Edward the Confessor, we suggest it was an English, not a Northumbrian, orchestrated invasion, perhaps in response to Macbeth's harbouring of the Normans. By the standards of the day, the invading force was huge. The Northumbrian Chronicle itself paints a vivid picture. A large Northumbrian fleet led by Canmore captured the city of Dundee, and was joined by Scottish rebels including Horse. They marched out of the plains of Gawire. They marched out of the plains of Gawire, past the capital of Scone and Edinburgh, probably pillaging in an attempt to force Macbeth to face them. Macbeth presumably having to ride up and down the country to muster enough forces to fight such a huge invasion. The campaign was recorded as being costly in men to both sides and in cul and culminated in one of the most massive battles seen to date in Scotland, the Battle of Seven Sleepers. That's Dunsinane. The Northumbrian Chronicle tells little of the battle itself, but that Macbeth's forces charged down from the hills at the Northumbrians and were put to flight. The Annals of Ulster record as many as 3,000 Scottish dead, 1,500 English dead, and all of Macbeth's Normans wiped out. The Battle of Seven Sleepers put Canmore in firm control of the Lowlands. For the English, this was enough who made a separate peace with Macbeth and returned home with their booty, leaving Canmore with only his own forces. Canmore, now without English support, lacked the power to venture into the Highlands and confront Macbeth. Meanwhile, Macbeth, still Earl of Moray, the most powerful earldom in Scotland, retreated to the security of his Highland kingdom, where he mounted a guerrilla war against Canmore, raiding south. For three years, Macbeth carried out his war, leading ambitious raids deep down into the lowlands and then retreating north, assured the lowlands could never follow him. But he was proven wrong. In 1057, Malcolm Canmore managed to lead a force across the Grampian Mountains and ambush the unsuspecting Macbeth in the village of Lumphanon, deep in Moray, as he returned home from a southern foray. Macbeth was slain in the battle. Macbeth died in 1057 at the age of 52. He had been King of Scotland for 17 years. It is always said, with the the death of Macbeth died Tanner Street in Scotland, as Malcolm Canmore and his descendants ruled in primogeniture from then on. However, in a great twist of irony, it was perhaps Macbeth himself who ended it. Macbeth was succeeded by his son Lulac, often known as Lulac Foolish. He was never crowned. Lulac survived his father by only seven months before Canmore invaded Moray and slew him, whereas Canmore himself was succeeded by his brother briefly before his son. Macbeth may not have been the last Tanais monarch of Scotland, but he was actually the last Highlander ever to rule Scotland. If you've enjoyed this broadcast, please click the like button and subscribe to the channel, and I'll be back with some more obscure history, hopefully in a week or two.